So innovation. Innovation is the solution. And I think that's really where a carbon tax makes the best sense because it, it incentivizes a wide range of things. You don't have to rely on government. Let me just hammer the point home about politicians one more time. I worked in politics so I could bash politicians. Uh, Bill Gates was talking to Wired about the solutions for climate change, and he says over 90% of subsidies are on deploying technology and not on R&D. You can buy as much old technology as you want, but you can't get the breakthroughs which only come out of basic research. We don't have innovation in energy. We don't have much at all. And again, why is it that we're spending 90% of our money on current technology? It's because for politicians, they want to be able to point to something. Here's what I did. Here's what I did. Saying, I put money into R&D and hopefully someday it will turn up something is very difficult to sell. Um, you can't take credit for it. Um, it's not very tangible. People don't like doing it. It's faith. It sounds like it's faith-based. So when you, when you do those sorts of things, um, they end up saying, you know, I'd rather spend it on something tangible today than something in the future. How much time do I have? I have 30 seconds. <laughs> so, what we need to do is we can't go the Social Security route, put the money in the hands of politicians, and hope that they'll spend it wisely. You've got to tax what you don't want and cut taxes on what you do. What we need is technology. So, cut taxes on innovation and then cut taxes on sales. Somebody talked about the regressiveness. Sales tax is regressive. Cut regressive tax and replace it with a tax that unfortunately is regressive. This is both politically and economically wise. Polls show that people don't just want to put a tax increase and use the money for something. They want an offset. Okay? Studies show that capital investment is a proven way to create jobs. You invest in new capital, invest in new technology, the business grows, it creates jobs. And that's what we need to do. Ultimately, we need to replace the web of regulations that we have now that are disjointed with a simple and transparent carbon price, make it carbon neutral, Put it out there, give people incentives to innovate, give them incentives to reduce the carbon. And that first chart shows that the power over time of those prices will be very powerful. Thank you. Questions? Four minutes. Who has a question? About a year and a half ago, I think, I heard Evan Cantor, who's past president of Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility, talk in town to the EPA. He quoted a WHO estimate of 300,000 deaths worldwide because of climate change. So I would ask you and just put the issue out there. How do we take into account all the deaths that are occurring around the planet, especially in countries that aren't as capable of adapting as we are? So the question is, how do you deal with the potential impacts of climate change and the 300,000 deaths uh, due to climate change? The first problem, I, I think, is, is that there are a lot of numbers out there that are relatively unreliable. So if you just heard that there was a study put out by the UN, and I think it was by the WHO in 2005, right. that said that there were going to be 50 million climate refugees by 2010. Well, there weren't 50 million climate refugees by 2010. If you go back to the web page, they didn't change the press release, they changed the number to 2020. So it, it's, it's very difficult to... to that's the challenge with Nordhaus and Stern, is that's why those numbers are so different, is because it's hard to figure out the impacts. The way to deal with that, though, is to make the system simple and transparent. So if we're seeing impacts greater than we expected, it's simple to change the price, to increase it, to say the impacts are larger than we expected, and therefore you have to internalize those higher prices. If you're relying on lots of regulations and picking and choosing technologies, it's far more difficult to adjust all of that when our uh, estimates of impact and other things are wrong. Todd, uh, just a political question. You know, sounds like you're supporting the premise of the carbon tax. You know, given the details of revenue and mortality. Your colleagues on the conservative side, do you think that there's an appetite for this realistically within the state of Washington? And what, how, do you, how would you describe the landscape right now? I will point out that uh, the BC passed a carbon tax under a Tory government. And I will point out that the carbon tax that has been complemented most so far was proposed by a Republican. So as to the political appetite, I will be honest with the challenge, and that is that the politics is trumping the science. So they asked Cliff, you know, what can we do to convince people that this is real? The challenge for people on the right is they never get to the point of considering whether the science is real because what they think is, is it's a Trojan horse for lots of other social policies. 
And so I hate to tell you that that cartoon that says, what if we do make the world a better place and there is no global warming and it has all this list of policies? That scares the hell out of Republicans. Because what it says is, yeah, maybe it's not true, but we get all of the social policies we want. What Republicans hear is, aha, that's what you're really all about. You're really all about trying to use climate to do something else. And that interferes on both sides. Believe me, there's politics on both sides of this. It's very difficult. But if you don't recognize that the politics is trumping the science, and that the perception that climate change is being used to achieve other goals is undermining the bipartisan nature of this, then you're not serious about really addressing those problems. Can I ask a follow-up question to that? Does that mean then that we talk about the science or we don't? Absolutely, you got to talk about the science. So I gave a speech yesterday to a group of Republican candidates, and one of the things that I told them was, don't say it's a hoax. It's not a hoax. Here's, here are skeptical scientists like um, uh, uh, Roy Spencer from the University of Huntsville, Alabama. Rush Limbaugh refers to him as the official climate scientist of the Rush Limbaugh show, right? <laughs> so if you go to his webpage, he says, a doubling of CO2 emissions will cause an increase in temperature of about one degree Celsius. Now that may, may be lower than other people think, but it's not zero. So what Roy Spencer, the skeptical scientist, is saying, it is not that CO2 emissions impact the climate. Mm -hmm. And I tell them, look, that, that means it may be smaller than what Al Gore says, but it's not zero. So it's a, it's a long process. But again, you know, it's hard for people, hard for Republicans to hear that. And I get all the time people saying, you're just trying, you live in Seattle, so you want all your Seattle liberals to like you. So you say these things. And it, they really say that. And it's and it's, and again, it's the politics that intercedes on the science. But definitely you've got to talk about the science. But you've got to talk about the uncertainties too. Right? One more question or uh, I'm done. There'll be some more time for questions again. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you.